Okay, so we're at the top of the hour. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another ICTBS DES seminar. Um, today, we have with us um, a few special uh, guests here to present some work. But before that, let me introduce to you the host of the session. Please welcome Dr. George Mason. He is somebody who's very re renowned in our society. I'm sure everybody knows about him. Um, just a little bit about him. He has worked for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, ERDC, for, I, I mean, over 30 years, I guess. And he's also been a part of CAS after that, which is the Center for um, Advanced Vehicle Systems at Mississippi State University. So he's been a professor there, too, and now he's probably retired, and he's um, here doing a lot of ice TBS work. So he's our host for today. Uh, please let me welcome Dr. George Mason. Well, th thank you, Varsha. Thank you, Varsha. And, and it's uh, my, my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Zabab Zanab from uh, the Ontario Tech University. Uh, Dr. Zanab is, is going to, she, she will talk to us about tire performance and, and particularly a truck tire performance on unsaturated sand. She hails from the Faculty of Engineering and Applied Science Department of Automotive Electronics Engineering. And her presentation will be using finite element analysis and a smooth particle hydrodynamics to model moisture migration in the sand, providing output of uh, tractive force, motion resistance, and sinkage. The paper is, um, should be very, very good. Uh, before I, I present Dr. Sinop, I, I'd like to mention that we will have a conference in Japan in, in the latter part of October for ISTVS. There's over 77 papers there, and I encourage everyone to attend. Uh, go out on the ISTVS webpage, and the information will be there. Well, Dr. Sinop, without, without any further ado, I I'll turn it over to you for your presentation. Oh, one last thing. As you ask questions or you come up with questions, which will be um, at the end of the presentation, there's a chat box. If you'll put those questions in the chat box, uh, we'll, 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 present, uh, we'll ask Dr. Sanab at, at the end of the presentation. But it uh, certainly seems to work pretty well if, you, if you'll write those questions out as she's making her presentation. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sadat, it's, it's, it's yours now. Thank you, Dr. George. Uh, so thank you for having me here and uh, welcome to my presentation. Um, so for today, we're going to focus on the influence of the uh, sand moisture content on the uh, truck tire performance, and we're going to be uh, introducing some hybrid techniques. Um, and later on, I'll explain what those hybrid techniques mean. Um, so starting with my outline. So for today, we're going to have a small introduction about our lab here at Ontario Tech University. And then a little bit small introduction as well about the tire terrain interaction research that we carry on. And starting with number three, that is the core of this presentation, which is the terrain modeling techniques. How do we model terrains? Different techniques, different methods. And then we're going to explain a little bit about the moist terrain modeling, because usually when we start by applying or by uh, modeling terrains, we start by a dry terrain, and then we do have some kind of a two-phase flow interaction. So this is what we're going to speak about in uh, number uh, four. And then we're going to move on to the tire modeling and validation, different types of modeling techniques, what types of tires do we use, and so on. And then finally, moving to the tire terrain interaction, which is the core results of this uh, research work, and then the conclusions and the uh, future works, which is technically a general future work related to uh, the, 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 the research lab. So starting with the introduction, here at Ontario Tech, we do have multiple research capabilities, starting with the virtual tire terrain lab. And this is, I think, the core uh, research that we're going to speak about 
today. So regarding the techniques, we do use some finite element techniques along with some meshless techniques like uh, smooth particle hydrodynamics. And this we usually do using a software called either PAMCRASH. PAMCRASH is not that popular, but it's uh, similar to ANSYS and uh, Alice Dyna or Abacus when it comes to FEA analysis. Uh, the other research category that we also uh, have is the human safety, and that includes uh, modeling of virtual humans using different techniques in PAM crash and Alistina, as well as the crash analysis of different vehicles and the uh, protection systems or protection devices uh, for trucks. Uh, the third category of research that we also have is the vehicle dynamics and the human factor lab. And this includes a truck driving simulator, which, which is not the topic of this uh, talk today, but it's good to introduce it as well. So the truck driving simulator is an actual simulator that is used to training drivers and designing uh, alert systems, as well as, as well as the vehicle dynamics and control simulations, which we usually uh, perform using uh, highly nonlinear uh, softwares like TruckSim and CarSim, in addition to MATLAB and Simulink to design the control algorithms. But for today's research or for today's topic, we're only focusing on that first part in here, that is the virtual tire terrain uh, interaction analysis. So with that being said, I'm going to introduce a little bit about what type of tires, what type of tire terrain interaction research that we carry out. Um, we do have three different categories for the tires that we research in the lab in here. The first one is the truck tire. And again, the truck tire is the bigger tires that are used in trucks. We do have the R22.5. We do also have the dual tires and the single tires. And so the super single is more popular in Europe, but we do have some research done on a wide base or super single tires. In these types of uh, tires, we do on-road operations, which is basically on uh, dry asphalt or on wet asphalt. And then we also do off-road operations. And when we speak about off-road operations, we usually do soils and we also do snow as well. Uh, and the last thing we do as well is the wear analysis. This is one of the newer topics that we have been uh, researching. Uh, we also have passenger car tires as well. In the passenger car tires category, we usually focus on on-road as well as contaminated surfaces, which is basically when it's snowing or partially raining, those what we refer to as contaminated uh, surfaces. And in the passenger categories, we also, as a newer research, we're carrying on some sort of a thermal analysis to determine the effect of temperature on the uh, tire road interaction. The third category of tires that we've been researching is the uh, non-pneumatic tires. And non-pneumatics, even though it's not the topic of this uh, uh, talk today, but it's a very interesting type of tires. It's an airless tire. It's, it's kind of a robust tire. It's been here for a while. Uh, it's very popular type of tires. We do some on-road and off-road operations. And we do some spoke analysis because when it comes to non-pneumatic tires, you have the tweel design, the straight spokes, the honeycomb. So we do some kind of analysis on that as well. And to some extent, the thread, uh, thread design analysis for the non-pneumatic tires. But for today, the, the most important topic that we're going to talk about is the terrain modeling and the tire terrain interaction. So the first question is, how do we model terrains and how are we able to calibrate those uh, terrains? So we have two different techniques that you could potentially use to model any type of terrain, uh, soft terrain. To be, to be clear. Uh, you could either use finite element analysis or you can use the smooth particle hydrodynamics technique. Now, the finite element is an older technique. It is faster in terms of simulation time. However, it does not give proper results for soil as because it is a smooth, uh, because it is finite element, you do not have that, you do have a sponge effect between your uh, elements. And so you don't have that discontinuity, which you usually require when it comes uh, to soil. And so basically research has shown that the FEA technique, when it comes to soil modeling, it has some limitations in terms of penetrations and the sponge effect. So with that being said, we did move from FEA analysis to SPH analysis, which is the meshless smooth particle hydrodynamics technique, which is better 
and more accurate for modeling the soils. However, with, with a higher accuracy comes the cost of longer simulation times. So SPH requires usually more simulation times. It is suitable for modeling deformable uh, soils uh, such as uh, sand, clay, snow, and other types of uh, terrains. Now, it is, again, suitable for modeling the soil. So how do we do that? Even though the SPH is a technically meshless technique or a mesh-free technique, you should start with an FEA model of your soil. So we always start with designing an FEA model and then taking the center of these uh, elements, which is then transferred into a part by itself. So this is how we get our particles. So each particle, even though it is not associated as an element, still it is based on an element size and an element characteristic. So with the smooth particle hydrodynamics, the difference between this, the SPH and the FEA is that the SPH is a particle based. So that means it has a center, it has a radius, and it also has a volume. It's based on the mass and momentum conservation equations, which are listed in here for your density and for your volume. So these are behind the scene equations that are used in the softwares, but it's always good to know the theory behind uh, the softwares that you're using. So with the two conservation equations for mass and momentum, you are also able to define your uh, delta in here, which is basically your uh, chronic delta. And those are some of the parameters that lie behind the, uh, the SPH technique. In terms of soils, we usually start with material type 7, or what we refer to as an isometric elastic plastic hydrodynamics. This is the material that we usually start with to model uh, soil behavior. And this is the pressure uh, volume relationship or the pressure density relationship that we use for the isometric or, or uh, isotropic elastic plastic material. Uh, now, because we're speaking about moist terrain, so the terrain itself, that is the soil, we start with the dry soil and it's modeled using the uh, isotropic elastic plastic material. And then we do add on top of that some kind of a liquid or a water element. And those water elements are generally modeled with the material, it's, it's referred to as type 28, but it's the Mornagan equation of state. And that is what we usually use in order to model our water particles. Because in order to moisturize the soil, we're starting with the dry soil, and then we're adding on top of that some kind of a water in order to do a two-phase flow interaction. And so this is the governing equation that is, again, behind the scenes and used by the software to compute the pressure volume relationship. Now, when it comes to the material characteristics, there is a lot of literature that is done about the density, the uh, bulk modulus, and other parameters that are required for soil modeling. But in order to get the best results or the best calibration, we do have to do at least two tests in order to calibrate our soils. So to calibrate our soils, again, we do use two different tests. You could use as many as you want, but at least you need two to three tests. And depending on what type of data you have available as well. So we use the pressure sinkage test and then we use the uh, shear strength test. So those two tests, we do them using the simulations. Uh, so basically we simulate those two tests on our uh, software. And at the same time, we have some experimental results which are obtained either from literature or from experiments that we have done uh, ourselves. And then we compare the results between the simulation and the uh, measurements, and then we iterate and we manipulate the, the results of the uh, pressure sinkage uh, relationship or the uh, C values that you see in here until we get the proper uh, behavior that we are looking for. So the first uh, test I mentioned was the pressure sinkage test. And in a pressure sinkage test, what we do is we apply the desired pressure on top of the plate that you see in here. So there's a pressure applied on the plate. And then we technically run the simulations for four seconds, which is enough for us to reach steady state. So with that being said, we do read the displacement of the uh, uh, plate at different uh, pressures and we plot the relationship and we compare it to whatever literature we have or experimental. In this case, we usually do the, uh, the sinkage relationship provided by Wang and the KCB, well, KCK, theta and n, those are the terrain properties uh, mentioned in literature. 
The second test that we performed to determine the characteristics of the soil or to calibrate the soil itself is the direct shear strength test. In this test, we do apply pressure on top of the gray plate in here, and then we apply displacement to the uh, two plates that you see in here. So with that displacement, we compute the shear force acting on the particles, and we repeat this test for several pressures. And then we compare it with the maximum shear equation, which relates your shear uh, to, to your pressure applied in terms of your cohesion and your angle of shear resistance. The cohesion and angle of shear resistance we can compute them from our simulations and we compare them to the provided uh, literature. So for the sake of this study, even though here at Ontario Tech, we do have a big library of uh, data for soils, we are only focusing on the dry sand. So we start with the dry sand and then we moisturize it. So this in here shows the results of the shear strength versus pressure and the sinkage versus pressure. So basically this is your direct shear test results and this is the results uh, from the pressure sinkage test. And so if we see between the measurement and the results, we see sort of a good agreement. And that is after calibration. So that was not done from one trial, that was done from a series of calibrations in order to achieve those uh, behaviors. Now that we have our dry sand, which is our benchmark, we could move on to the moisturizing technique or to moisturize this, uh, this sand. So in here, we speak about what we refer to as a two-phase flow. When we speak about two-phase, we, we are actually referring to a water particles combined with the soil particles. Uh, of course, you will, reach fully you will reach the saturation level at some point whenever your soil saturates. But before that, it is under saturated soil just to see the effect of the moisturizing on the soil itself. With that, we again use the, the Navier-Stokes equations. The same conservation equation still applies. Water is modeled with the Mornagan equation of state, as I mentioned before, and the soil is modeled using material seven, which is the uh, isotropic elastic plastic uh, material. And within the two-phase flow, we do have the uh, Darcy's law to be implemented, and that is what applies the seepage force between our water and the soil particles. So we start with the water particles layered on top of our soil particles, which are then combined into becoming a moist uh, soil. That is in terms of simulations. So in order to do that, we do also have to carry on some experimental testing. So how do we define the moisture level? How do we know that this is dry soil or 10% or you know 20% moist soil? So we use a simple technique, which is basically based on volume. So we did the volume of the uh, soil, the volume of the water, and then we carried on the volume or the percentage of the moisture based on the equation provided in here, which is based on volumes. So if you look at this figure in here, this figure just shows the direct shear strength test. Now, this is part of your box that where you apply your pressure and then you start moving in order to calculate the shear. So if you look at this part in here, you will see the brown particles in here are our uh, soil and the blue particles on top are our uh, water particles. So when the pressure is applied, the water is merged into the sand and this way we are moisturizing our uh, soil. So this is from a simulation perspective. We also carried out a calibration or we also carried out some experimental testing that was done um, few years ago, it was done at the Geoengineering Research Lab at Carleton University in Ottawa. And this is the machine that we use at this time. So it's basically a, a direct shear strength test. Uh, we used the, we started by, by a purely graded uh, and the non-plastic standard soil. And that one was the sand that we just calibrated in the previous uh, slides. And for the sake of the study, we were interested in moisturizing the soil at, well, 0% is our benchmark and then 10, 20, 30, 40, 50%. I'm not showing all the results, but we went up to 62% uh, with the experimental work. But for the sake of the study, we're only going up to uh, 50%. And we did measure in, on top of the shear strength characteristics, the curves that we were usually getting. We also measured the bulk density and the shearing characteristics. The figure in here just shows a sample of the tested sand that we used and the figure and here shows the direct shear strength along with the monitor screen where we were getting the results. So comparing the results that we obtained from the moisturizing technique, which is the two-phase flow interaction, and the results that we got from the physical testing, we were able to plot 
both the uh, shear strength and the pressure sinkage relationships at different moisture content. So that 0% that you see in here is the dry sand that we started with in the, in the previous uh, section. And then we went to 10, 20, 30, and 40. And we could see that 50% somehow lied under the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the uh, moist soils, but the rest of them had a similar trend. And that 50% in here as well, it was a little bit uh, below the rest of the results, but all the other percentages from zero to 30% uh, showed a consistent uh, trend. Now, the, the reduction at the 50% could be that the soil was reaching its saturation limit, and it, it could just be lying a little bit lower than the rest of them. Now that we modeled our soil, dry soil, and then we were able to, to validate our moisturizing technique, we can move on to the tire modeling and validation. Because when we speak about tire-terrain interaction, we need a tire and we need a terrain. So right now we just finished the terrain part. So we need to move to the tire part. So for the tire modeling, one of the classical ways to model tires is using finite element analysis. And in our finite element tire model, we're using a 31580R22.5 uh, tire model. And this tire model is very common for the trucks that, that we are utilizing for this research. So this is a very popular tire size. Usually, if you see those on the roads, you will see them as dual configurations. Uh, so the tire is modeled node by node. We do have 27 different materials with around 4,200 solid elements, 1,680 membrane elements, and 120 uh, beam elements. And what we see in here is the construction of the tire. So those are the different layers of the tire model. And this is just the size of the tire that we are dealing with. So regarding the, the, the different types of uh, materials or elements that we used, we do have 14 layered elements. And those are some of the material characteristics that is already published in, in previous research. So those material characteristics are obtained from our previous uh, publications and from our previous uh, research. So we do require the density, the thickness, uh, the uh, isotropic uh, parent shear young modulus. We do also have the isotropic parent shear Poisson's ratio, some of the layer young and shear moduluses as well. And of course the angle. So this is a radial ply tire. So those are the layered elements that we see on the slides in here. And then for the solid elements, which is basically your uh, bead fillers, your thread, shoulder, your thread and your under thread and your thread cap as well. Those are all modeled using solid elements and specifically using the Mooney Rivellin material, which is basically this is your uh, strain energy density equation where you de technically require the two coefficients C10 and C01. Those are during loading and unloading. And those are some of the characteristics of the uh, basically material 21 to material uh, 26, which are modeled again using the Mooney Rivellin. We did also use beam elements, but beam elements was basically the location is in here and that is only used to model the beads. And those are some of the characteristics that we also have along with the cross-sectional description. It's a circular, of course. Now that we, we have shown all of our tire model, considering all of the different elements, we still have the rim. Technically, it's part of the wheel. So. When it comes to the rim definitions, we do use the an uh, isotropic material and we model the rim using shell elements. The reason why is because technically speaking, the rim is a rigid body. So we do consider the rim to be a non-deformable. The only reason is it really improves our simulation times. And it's a valid assumption for most of the cases that the rim is a, is a rigid body. So this is the rim that we have and this is some of the material properties that we used. So now that we have a, a complete tire model with different materials and different uh, elements along with the rim, and the rim is connected to our uh, tire using a rigid body definition, we can move on to validating the tire model. Whenever a tire is validated, it has to be validated in different responses and in different domains. So the first thing we're going to show in here is the static validation. In a static validation, we have two different types of tests. So we carry on the... Uh, vertical stiffness test and the static footprint test. 
So what we see in here is just a vertical, a simple vertical stiffness test where a ramp load is applied to the tire, and then we measure the load versus deflection. And we see in here the experimental and the simulation results uh, as well. So just a simple uh, loading of the, we pressurize the tire, of course, and then we apply a vertical load ramp. We measure uh, load versus displacement, and uh, the results are in here. Also, if you wanted to calculate the vertical stiffness of the tire, you could just do that by finding the slope of the lines in the linear region. The second static validation test that we carry out is the uh, footprint test. In a footprint test, we apply a constant load. So when we apply a constant load, it means we can actually plot the contact area versus your vertical load. Uh, and with that being said, we do see in here the FEA analysis of the basically different types of uh, um, tires along with the uh, results of the uh, provided by the manufacturer. And in here, we just see some sort of a nodal uh, or the normal nodal velocity, which is a contouring at 586 kPa. So those two tests are carried on in static domain. The third test is the uh, is carried on in the dynamic domain, and that is your drum cleat test. So in a drum cleat test, this is a test that is usually done to determine the modes of vibration, or at least the first mode of vertical and horizontal vibrations uh, of the tire. There's a small cleat that is going to pass in here, and the tire is excited over uh, this cleat. Uh, yeah, right here. And then we can see in here that usually this is done in time domain and then converted to frequency domain using the fast Fourier series transformation or the FFT uh, transformation. So in here we see the vertical uh, force versus the frequency and we can see the first mode of vibration, which is the peak in here at different inflation pressures. And so that peak in here usually ranges anywhere between uh, 50 and uh, 60 or 70 Hertz and it is within the domain. We don't have specific numbers, but it is within the well-known domain of uh, truck tires. The last test that is carried out is the dynamic validation test, which is the uh, cornering stiffness test. So in a cornering stiffness test, the tire is usually pre-steered into a specific angle. So this is the steering angle that we usually uh, uh, steer the tire with, and then we do apply a velocity in the direction of motion, and we measure different variables. So for the sake of this um, validation, we're only measuring the cornering force versus a slip angle at different uh, vertical loads. So we can see 36, 27, and 18, and this is measurements and finite element. And the slope of the line in here is usually your cornering stiffness. So after that, it's non-linear, so we don't speak about stiffness after two or four degrees, but before that is where you technically measure your cornering uh, stiffness. So now that we have established a well-calibrated soil model and a validated tire model, we can move on to the tire-terrain interaction analysis. So with the tire-terrain interaction analysis, for the sake of this presentation, we're only presenting the traction analysis. So this is where the tire is driven. However, you could do any type of tests that you can imagine. So you can do a rolling resistance test. You can do a steering test. You could do any type of uh, obstacle tests. So anything can be done. But for this study, because it's based on the published paper, we are only presenting the uh, traction, steady state and transient traction tests. So the operating conditions or the variables that we were looking at is the speed. So this is off-road over dry and moist sand. So we didn't go into very high speeds. We, we tested 10, 20, and 30 kilometers per hour. We tested different moisture content, 0, 25, and 50%. Uh, and then we tested different vertical loads, which are 13, 26, and 40 kilonewtons. And this is based on the recommended uh, vertical loads for this specific type. Some of the operating conditions that we did not discuss uh, in this study, but it's worth mentioning for future, is inflation pressure. You could vary inflation pressure of the tire, and that most likely will have an effect in off-road operations. And controlled slip. So you could actually apply speed and angular velocity to your tire and control your slip. If you just wanted to run at 50% slip or 20% slip, you, that is also an option for you to control your slip, which was not done in this uh, study. So what parameters do we look at when we say tire terrain interaction? What outputs are we looking at? The first thing we look at is the tire sinkage. 
because the tire sinkage is going to show us the contact area. It's going to show us a lot of insights into how the tire is behaving at different operating conditions. We look at different forces. So we do look at vertical, lateral, and longitudinal forces, which are on the tire uh, soil or the tire terrain interaction area. We do, we do look at the linear long, uh, longitudinal uh, speed of the tire. And we do look at the angular uh, velocity of the tire. And because this is traction performance, we're also looking at the torque, which is produced by the tire. So how does the traction test setup work? Because this is simulations, we have to inflate the tire. So usually, you know, if you go to experiments, the tire is inflated, you just have to make sure the tire pressure is correct. But in this case, the first thing we do is we inflate the tire to the desired inflation pressure. In this case, we didn't vary the pressure. So it was only the nominal inflation pressure of the tire. And then we apply load on top of the tire. So we apply load on the center of the tire and then we allow the tire to settle on the soil and after that we apply because we are mimicking traction it means we have to apply angular velocity because that will apply that will mimic the torque applied on the center of the tire so we do apply angular velocity at the center of the tire and then we do measure the longitudinal and vertical forces along with the torque and the other uh, and the radius i didn't mention that but we do measure the uh, rolling radius uh, or the effective radius of the tire as well. So to calculate your traction effort coefficient, you divide your torque by your radius and your uh, vertical force. And first we're going to look at, at just some kind of uh, animations or some kind of uh, contouring, and then we're gonna show the actual results. So one thing that we'll, we look at is the rut depth or the depth that is left inside the soil after the tire runs over. And in here, we see two things. So we see at uh, 10 kilometers per hour and we see at 20 kilometers per hour. And we can see the effect of the rut inside the soil that we see in here. We can see more uh, red in this, in this figure compared to this one. So the rut depth is something that we look into when we want to analyze the results. Another thing interesting that we look at uh, is the flow pattern in the soil. Uh, that's in terms of soils. So we do look also at the flow patterns inside the, the soil. And in this case, we are able to see if we applied only angular velocity, we are able to mimic the uh, spinning tire, which is a at 100% slip in here. So you can see how the soil is flowing from point A to point uh, E in here. And then we can also apply a locked tire as well. So this is where we're only dragging it with a vertical with a velocity, and we could see the the flow pattern at the front of the tire. Then we can also see driven tire, which is basically could be ranging at the different uh, slip angles or uh, longitudinal slip uh, percentages, and we can see the flow patterns in in the bottom of the soil in here on both uh, sides as well. And then a toe tire, which is basically as well, you could see the shear uh, effect between A, D, B, that region in here, and as well as the back of the tire in here. So flow patterns and rod depths are visual things that we can look at when we are uh, looking at our simulations. Other than the visual, there are numbers that we can look at when we speak about the interaction between the tire and the soil. So the first thing that we're going to look at uh, in our tractive effort. So in this figure in here, what we see is the tractive effort coefficient. That's because it's normalized with respect to the uh, FZ or your applied normal uh, force with respect to the sand moisture content at different uh, speeds. So obviously the highest speed is going to have the highest tractive effort. And then at the same time, the, the lowest moisture content is going to have the highest uh, tractive effort because the soil is not moist enough. So basically speaking, you have more resistance in a, in a, in a dry soil uh, rather than a moist soil. So, but the, but the trend is similar for all uh, applied speeds and it's pretty similar when it comes to the sand uh, moisture content. In this case, we did apply normal vertical load. That is the middle, middle range of the vertical load and the nominal uh, inflation pressure. The second variable that we look at is the uh, vertical loads. So this time we did apply, or the, those results are just at 10 kilometers per hour speed, but it shows the effect of the vertical load. So the higher vertical load you have, the more sinkage you have in your 
uh, soil. And then, of course, the more attractive effort you will need to get out of the uh, of the soil. And the lowest vertical load will have the you know the lowest attractive effort as well. So even though the tire is driven and we are calculating the tractive effort, we could still estimate our motion resistance. And the way the motion resistance is estimated is by subtracting our contact longitudinal force from our traction force, which is obtained from the torque. So if we subtract those two forces, the difference between them is the loss, which we're getting in terms of motion resistance. Uh, usually on road, we refer to it as a rolling resistance, but when it comes to off road, we do prefer to refer to it as a motion resistance because it's lost uh, in the motion. So in here, we see the, uh, the uh, motion resistance coefficient versus the sand moisture content at different uh, speeds. And the highest speed has the highest motion resistance. And with, with moist soil, you get less or you, you get less moist, uh, uh, motion resistance just because, you know, you, your soil is more moist. So you, you move better and faster in, the, in these types of uh, soils. The last thing we looked at, and it was a bit interesting, is the uh, in terms of steady state analysis, is the lateral contact forces. Even though the tire is moving straight, but because of the soil effect and because of the uh, because of the nature of the tire digging into the soil, we do generate little bit, not too much. So if it's 500 newtons, and you're comparing it to a nominal vertical load of 26 kilonewtons, that's not much, but we do generate some kind of lateral forces at, at the contact as well. And in this case, again, the, the, the higher speed, the more lateral forces you generate, the more sand moist you have, the more lateral forces that you uh, generate. And really the last thing we looked at is the transient because the tire basically, in these cases, whatever I showed before in terms of tractive effort, those were steady state. But before the tire reaches a steady state, you have your traction stage where you have a slip ranging between zero and around 80% in this case. So what we're looking at in here is your longitudinal force versus your longitudinal slip. And there are multiple things that we can see in here. The first thing we're going to see or we can see is that the dry sand has the highest longitudinal forces, uh, but also it has the earliest peak. So it reaches the earliest peak in, in this point in here. And then at 50%, you're reaching your peak at little bit before 20% of your longitudinal uh, slip. And of course, the more you go with moist or the more moist, moist you have in your sand, the, the later you will peak in terms of your longitudinal uh, uh, slip. Uh, something to, to keep in mind is on a hard surface, usually that peaks happen between 5 to 10%, uh, just as a rough estimation. Now, those are all uh, simulation-based analysis. For this study, we were not able to do an experimental analysis, but I'm just showing you potentially what could be an experimental validation for the uh, for the results. The, the, this in here was part of the testing that we have done in uh, in one of the facilities, and we did run the uh, trucks at soil. Now, the problem with running trucks on soil is it's very hard to uh, especially with outdoors testing, it's very hard to control your environment if you want to moisturize your soil. In this case, the sand in here was identified as gravelly sand. So it's just gravel and sand. Uh, but that was done for a different uh, research. So basically, potentially, we do at some point want to look back, back at, you know, uh, experimental testing and how can we run the tire over controlled moist sand. I think that would require more of... Uh, um, indoor testing. So next is the conclusion. So basically the conclusions is we are able to model and validate a tire model using finite element analysis and Mooney River and material for rubber. Uh, we are able to model and calibrate dry sand using the SPH technique. And then we are also able to model uh, moist sand using the two phase flow interaction. And then we were able to predict the tractive performance over different operating conditions. So in terms of steady state, we, we were able to find that the longitudinal speed increases uh, or 
as the longitudinal speed increases, the tractive effort increases as well. The sand moisture had a rel rel relatively important effect on the uh, on the tire terrain interaction. And then our peak when it comes to the transient analysis was around 10 to uh, 17 percent. Um, and then in terms of the future work, we will go back to our research uh, areas in order to speak a little bit more about uh, research work. Of course, there is a lot more to be done in off-road operations. We still need some sort of experimental work. Uh, we can go back and check with discrete element methods, but all, those are not active uh, research that is going on uh, these days. But when it comes to truck tires, the, the, the active research is basically on a wear analysis. How are we able to predict the wear of a tire? And how are we able to uh, quantify the amount of pollutants that we are technically having on on a, on, on road, not off road. Um, so for that, we will need to move from Munirivalin material and upgrade into Ogden material, which is a destructive material mover. Now, for the passenger uh, tires, we're working more on the contaminated surfaces and the thermal analysis. And when it comes to the non-pneumatic tires, we are focusing more on the tread design and the improvement of our modeling uh, for the spokes because uh, they're a little bit more challenging to model than regular uh, uh, tire rubber compounds. So that was for my presentation for today. Thank you so much for being here and thank you for having me. I think, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I guess the first thing I need to do is look at the chats and, and see if, if there's some questions I may need, I don't see any right now. Um, Varsha, do you see any uh, questions? I see some. Well, let me let me ask one while we're waiting. Um, so, so moisture, how was it measured? Volumetric, gravimetric? So it was measured before, so based on the volume equation. That's how we measured it at Carleton University. So it was a volumetric moisture content going up to 50%. Uh, did you measure uh, uh, pore pressures, uh, total and effective stresses? Yeah. And, and, okay. We and they were. Stresses, but it was not part of this uh, research publication. If you go back to slide 38, oh, I, I see. I'm, I have some questions coming in now. Um, yeah. What, what, what is your view? And this is coming from Boamir, I believe. Uh, what is your view on using? commercial software versus open source software, do you feel restricted in what you can do with the commercial software versus open source? Um, th that's a very good question. We have only had experience with commercial softwares. Um, it is a little bit more restrictive, yes, because you always have to go to the support to see, uh, okay, do you have these specific models? We're trying to do this specific analysis. Is there a way, especially now with the wear analysis, uh, but for the open source softwares, we do not have experience working with them before. But I'm guessing it will be, it will be, you know, each one of them has their own advantages and disadvantages. But for us, it was always the commercial softwares. This study was done on Pam Crash, so it's a, it's a, it's an ESI environment uh, software. Okay, this one comes from Alex Keane. Um, Dr. Keane is asked, uh, does soil flow at high moisture content involve viscosity, does Darcy's law then still apply? So I, I, I'm sorry, I was going to add to it, and I don't think I need to, but that there, I will try. Uh, there's certain measures called permeability and tension of the soil that can be measured in the field. I mean, are, are these part of your analysis? That, that's a very good question. So when we measured off-road in the soil, when we measured in here, the only sensors we had were on the tire itself, not in the soil. Um, just because of the nature of the, you know, the field that we had and the time that we had, because they were testing so many things on the truck and we were only part of the bigger testing uh, scheme. So 
all the results that we have from those experimental testing are measured on the tire transducers, not on the soil. However, for agricultural tire analysis, we had cases where we had sensors in the soil and then we were able to measure more parameters, but that was controlled indoor testing. What, what sensors were those? Um, I have to look back into the, the research paper, but we measured the stress in the soil itself, like at this, I think 30 centimeters depth or something. Maybe pore pressures. Um, well, okay, this this is very similar in nature. Uh, Yogesh, I, I guess I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, what What is the SPH element size you selected and how? So this may go back to um, the soil parameters and how maybe SPH element size relates to those. Yeah, so it was, uh, I remember that figure when we moved from uh, FEA to SPH here. Um, so that FEA was based on a 10 millimeters uh, definition. And then the center of each of those elements was taken to be the center of the uh, SPH. Now that, that 10 millimeter definition that we have in here, it is based on the recommendations of the uh, software. So at that time we had support and it was based on the recommendations. Uh, however, my take on, on, on the size of the particles is it is important, however, Later on, when you start your calibration, especially like in these types of tests, um, your parameters can be a little bit different depending on your soil size. So it's not a one size fits all. That number that you select, it's, it's an estimate. You could later on when you start doing your tests, see, okay, I'm having a very uh, stiff soil. So maybe I have to increase or reduce my element sizes and that can be done later on as well. So starting from here, it's a, it's a bulk estimate, and then you get more ideas once you recalibrate your soil, because the calibration is not one test. You could, Like for some type of soils, we had clay. Clay was a very challenging soil because it was very loose. Um, so we had to do around 60 iterations to get something that would, you know, relatively be acceptable. So he, he asked another question about element convergence study on the SPH. Have you done that? Have you? We we did earlier when we converted from FEA to SPH. We did some conversion study and we did some sensitivity analysis uh, for the SPH as well. But that was earlier because we moved to SPH um, back in I want to say 2015 or 14 is when we moved from FEA to SPH. And at that time, we had to do that. Uh, analysis of the conversion, yes. So, so, such a, we, we've got to start coming up with biblical names. Um, mm -hmm. what, what is your opinion on Abacus CEL soil modeling? I, I guess we have different parameters calibrated for different moisture levels. So uh, any, any thoughts on that soil, soil parameterization? Um, I, I, I do not have, the only experience I have with Abacus is for modeling tires and we had problems with that at high speed tires. When, when the tire was moving up, you know, more than 80 kilometers per hour, we had some problems, but I don't have experience specifically with Abacus when it comes to soil modeling. I'm guessing they have their own uh, parameters and it will be similar, but it wouldn't be identical because each software has, you know, their own sparkling touch on it, but I'm not sure about Abacus exactly. Uh, M. Simi, uh, it asked a question. Typically, liquid limit of sand is twenty percent or under liquid limit. You know, I'm not sure you have a liquid limit on a sand, but but that's okay. <laughs> uh, he's saying, I think he's what he's saying is is we're getting into um, saturation. We're getting into okay. I, I've lost the question now. I know. Um, Barsha, do you have that question in yep, front of you? Yep. I, I can Please. read it out. So typically Please. liquid limit of sand is 20% or under. I'm curious how the shear strength is higher at moisture levels about 20%. Is it because there's gravel content in the soil? So I guess he's referring to the shear strengths um, at different moisture percents, uh, percentages. And uh, I think the 21 a uh, 20 percent one was higher how the shear strength is higher at the moisture levels about 20 percent is it because there's some gravel content in the soil 
the, the the soil is marked as poorly graded there are you know it's 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 impure it's not like 100 percent uh, sand however we didn't see saturation at 20 percent saturation didn't happen until somewhere between 50 and 62 percent for this specific soil uh, type so we didn't see this is why you see at 50 percent you start seeing that the results are a little bit you know um deferring or as uh, outliners from the rest of the results but 20 percent was not a remarkable point for us at least for these types of of soil that we used so we used the again it was poorly graded there was some impurities in it as you can see in the in the results in here and that could be the reason why yes um, okay so jordan whitson asked that the, the becker wong total thrust force equation puts the total force generation on the frictional normal reaction component because cohesion contributes contribution goes to zero could you or the colleagues use this, this simulation prediction to inspect percentage increases of cohesion due to levels of moisture content do you think you could optimize a recommendation for tire diameter and size based on the environment for better vehicle performance yeah, I think that's something we'd always look into. So if we wanted to measure the cohesion uh, of the soil, uh, it's not difficult. It's just that when you're running the simulation, you're going to have to add elements in the soil itself. Uh, and that could be part of the analysis where, you know, you're looking more into the soil. So you're looking more into the flow in the soil. Uh, we didn't do that because our objective was for the tire terrain interaction analysis but there's always future improvements where we could look inside the soil elements we can place some particles inside the soil measure the uh, shear and then we could measure the cohesion in the soil itself so that's something we could always look into and i think it's a good idea for future research as well uh, is to look into because our main concept is the tire we don't care much about the soil we look at the soil to understand the tire tire soil interaction but there are other researchers which which are more interested in the soil itself and looking at uh, you know the cohesion of the soil uh, how much compressibility is there in the soil are we able to go back to the original soil that we had before and so on so that is possible if you place some kind of um, nodes or elements inside the soil but we didn't look into that okay uh, he says sounds great so Abomir, who's been working, I know Abomir has been working a good bit on rigid tires, is, is curious about uh, if you saw significant tire deformation and if the use of a rigid tire model versus a deformable would show large differences, hmm. prohibitively large differences. That, that's a very yeah. good question. <laughs> we do okay. see we, we do see tire deformation, especially on the sidewalls. Uh, so that we do see. The rim is not deformable. By definition, even for us, we don't define the rim as a deformable body. We, we do define it as a rigid body. However, the tire itself, yes, we do see a lot of deformation, especially at uh, high vertical loads. Um, and on road, we also see a lot of deformation as well. Like even if you look at, you know, uh, Okay, I'm sorry. I'm yeah, even if you look at this tire in here, you could still see the mm. deformation on the on the in the on the sidewalls. So the formation is something that yes, we see on road and off road. It's more visible on road at high uh, speeds and high vertical loads, but we see it in both on road and off road. Rigid body definitions. We did attempt few uh, rigid bodies or rigid tires before. Um, it, it simplifies your results. But it all depends upon what exactly you want to look at. So if you just want a simple analysis, you can always go with a with rigid uh, tire. Uh, if you're looking at a more, like say, for example, you want to do wear analysis, you cannot use a rigid uh, tire model. But if you're just looking at, you know, some kind of a bulking numbers or, you know, simple results, then, yeah, you could look. If you're interested more in the soil, you can also look at rigid uh, tire models. But if you're interested in thermal analysis or wear analysis or a more complicated tire, specifically tire analysis, then rigid is not uh, the best way to go. Okay. Okay. The uh, Boomer says, makes sense. Thank you very much. Yeah, I've got a question, um, uh, Pasha, if I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, could we go back, please, to the figure just before conclusions where you had slip and you had a hump shaped uh, curve? Uh, is it this one? Longitudinal slip and force. Right, well, that, that'll probably do as such because having done obviously quite a few tests with vehicles either in sand pits or, or even sand dunes at one point, what tends to happen if you take something like a four by four vehicle and then you start putting a drawbar pull on, the drawbar pull will go up, the slip will go up, in your example, maybe to uh, about 10%. And then at some point, pretty close to where you've got that data point of around about 10%, one wheel will actually overslip and then uh, the drawbar pull goes and then you start basically going down the slope very quickly, but you become mobilized very, very quickly. Uh, so I'm not quite sure how you collected that data. Is that simulation or is that measured? That because, is simulation. Yeah, because once you get over about 10% slip, you're, I know you can do this if you've got a wheel uh, in the soil tank and the wheel is driven and it's slipping, but what you probably find is sinkage starts to take place, the draw bar bull pull goes up and therefore if you're measuring the uh, what you're calling longitudinal force by draw bar um, then that would happen but your wheel basically in the real world would probably become immobilized when you get just past about 10 to 15 percent slip something like that so um, I'm not sure if you tried to validate or verify those results against uh, a, a real wheel or a wheels on a set of vehicles um, if you're driving the wheel at constant slip, you may start to see something like that, but you also find that the, the uh, uh, rolling resistance starts to increase with sinkage, hence your, your force goes down. In reality, if you've got a complete vehicle on a, on a test track, a sand test track, um, it becomes mobilized, immobilized very quickly once you get to the, around about the first data point. I don't know if anybody else has done those tests. George, have you seen that in practice uh, yourself? Yes. I think you've done a fair bit of these sorts of tests. So that my question would be is once you get past about uh, certainly 20% slip, um, then you'd need to analyze those points further. Um, I suspect if you can separate out uh, wheel thrust or wheel pull, whichever term you prefer, drawbar pull and rolling resistance, from about 20% on, you would see that the rolling resistance is increasing and continues to increase at a, at a fixed slip. But um, uh, I don't know if you've, if, if, if you've done that. Uh, that. That's a very interesting conclusion because we did see something similar like that. This is based on simulation results. So to be, to be clear, this is specific simulation results. However, when we did do our testing, it was a different soil. Uh, so we did have four axles. I know you cannot see that in here. So the first one was a steering, and then we had the driven, driven, and then tag uh, axle. We kind of looked into the, this uh, driven or this longitudinal slip versus um, versus longitudinal uh, forces. And we did see the same, the same as what you were referring to. However, our experimental work is very limited. And that's again, because we share those experiments with other departments uh, and so on. But we do see this, this is, you're completely correct. After this point, you, you will have much more resistance and it could be an uncontrolled situation. We did not test that in simulations specifically, but it is something that potentially can be simulated, yes. Yeah, if you can separate out the rolling resistance, you probably find it at a fixed uh, slip, it actually goes up effectively yeah. meaning you would move on to the next stage because your wheel would slow down almost stationary and you'd go up to a very high uh, wheel slip and all you're effectively dig doing is digging yourself in yeah. and i'm sure people have had that experience of of uh, going on to soft sandy ground uh, mm -hmm. with vehicles and then you suddenly find you've got a bigger problem to to remobilize the vehicle but um and that's one thing of, of, of always trying to keep the slip well, you've got uh, uh, around about, I'd say about 10% for maximum, a little bit more, about 18% for maximum slip when you would try and keep it, what, 80% uh, 
uh, below that to um, to make sure or the force down so that yeah. you don't actually put yourself into because once the uh, the immobilization starts it's very difficult to stop on sandy ground mm -hmm. yeah. yeah I think I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll just add to it that sand is kind of a fan uh, sand's a tough area because anything if you have more than 12 percent fines or passing 200 sieve that now it does begin to have a liquid limit and it does start to behave like a fine grain material uh, so it's, it's kind of critical to have a pure sand one you would find on a beach or, or in a desert that is void of any fines that, that but that's out in the field in, in, in yeah. course there is, of course, a common trick that once you start to get mobilized at around about 20% is stop immediately, reduce the tire pressure, and then you yeah, you often find that you can get going again, and then you have to, and some systems will obviously ha allow you to control uh, uh, tire pressure on the move, and that uh, can sometimes be quite useful. Yeah. So this moisture content is... You think it's volumetric, or is it? You think yeah. it's percent saturation? I shall. Uh, thank you. It's volumetric. Thank you. All right. All it's right. Based on the volume, because we measured it based on. Um, it was like the sand, and it's a volumetric. It's based on like basically the volumes. All right. All right. Well, very good. Um, I. Before I let you go, let me double check the. I, 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 oh, There's just one more. <laughs> the Boamir wants to know about the slip definition. What is the denominator of forward velocity and wheel circumference? It, it's this kind of interesting question because one of your slides mentions a positive and negative, um, no, a 100% slip, both in the positive and negative directions. For braking, you had 100% slip, and for. Yeah. Uh, and, and, Usually, braking slip is a different calculation than it's two, it's slip. two different equations. You're right. So there is one but, which is one minus v over omega r, and the other one is one minus omega r over v. It depends if the tire <laughs> is braking or accelerating. I think Wong has both equations uh, defined. I, I did not put them in the presentation, but you are right. Those are two different uh, definitions uh, for the slip: one in braking and one in accelerating, and they're opposite. <laughs> yeah, that's like one of the first things that when I look at the paper, I see the definition. Yeah, yeah, it depends. So it's either V over omega R or R over omega V, depending on which are you breaking or accelerating. Yeah. Very good. Ratio well, I think that's I it. Uh, thank, oops, I see somebody's typing one last question question well anyway. <laughs> that was jenna <laughs> all right all right well very good very good um uh, we enjoyed your talk um uh, varsha do you have did i miss anything or no i think i think it was perfect i guess that you know i, I think you know it was really nice today to see dr zena belsaix present today <laughs> and you're talking also about some future works on on where tire wear i guess in off-road condition is that what you guys are going to attempt well first you have to do on road then on road. So, that's <laughs> how you go off road <laughs> that would be so... off road it's always more difficult especially that the simulation time is longer it's so, so long. you have to have a good model so you can you know move to off road but usually we always try to start on road and then on take road. It, uh, off road yeah but tire even, wear uh, with non pneumatic tires, it's very uh -huh. interesting to see how the soil penetrates the spokes of the tire. And I think that's Ooh. something that maybe, you know, potentially we could be presenting in a year or so. Wow, wow. Non pneumatic tires, too. Yeah, there, there's a lot of work going on in non pneumatic tires. I know that society, especially the tire society, is yeah. really talking a lot about non pneumatic tires. And you guys are doing that work too. So I don't know, it's just, I think there's gonna be a lot of good papers that you guys are gonna be producing as a lab <laughs> um, in the next few years. Um, it'll be nice to keep, I guess, in, you know, updated with all of that. Um, and possibly you could even come in as another presentation yeah. <laughs> probably a year from now and tell us your updates. Um, so I think, I think, you know, this was a really good presentation. So. I guess if, you know, Dr. George Mason, if you have any
concluding remarks on the presentation, I would let it over to you um, because after that we do have a few other slides to show. Uh, no, no, I believe this this covers everything. It's uh, like you say, it's very interesting. Uh, it's a very difficult area when you begin to introduce moisture and moisture migration into soils and try to predict traction, moisture resistance from a simulation standpoint. There are effective pore pressures, there's total stresses and all sorts of crazy things that are changed with time. And so uh, it's, it's a very good presentation uh, on how to approach that and a model used to do it with. Uh, thank you very much for your time and your presentation to here today. Thank you. Okay, Barsha, back to you. Okay, so we have a few announcements to make towards the end. So Dr. George Mason, if you want to say these announcements so I can fly out the links, it'll be great. Wait. <laughs> what's, what's <laughs> oh, ju just about the, you know, stuff at ISTVS, the DES, um, you know, YouTube channel and stuff. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. There, there is well, uh, th this this will be placed out on the YouTube channel for the digital events series, which is an ongoing series that we we recruit people that have areas of interest related to terrain vehicle society. Um, membership in the ISTVS is is critical to keep the organization alive and to keep these professional presentations moving forward. Um, Barsha is sending a link out to those uh, DES sites. You're, you're welcome to uh, look at them. We've been presenting now for over the last two years, and, and the last few have been uh, focused on simulation. Uh, we will have some presentations in the upcoming months. Uh, the next one, I believe, is is with Brent Town. It's it's going to uh, and and. Brad, the, out of the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Engineer Research and Development Center, they are going to present on the key performance parameters related to the movement of vehicles. They test vehicles that are presented for uh, the Army buys vehicles like the Humvee, the Jeep, the, over the years, but they have to test to see if they meet certain criteria and thin them down to the the people of interest. The the, the organizations say <laughs> when they purchase the vehicles whether they're going to purchase it from Lockheed or Oshkosh or other vendors and so they have to come up with performance criteria and and, and this and Brent tests some of those performance criteria in particular soft soil performance and he's going to go over how they test those uh, and the methods they use and and what he, what he's seen out in the field in the soft soil area it's a it's a very interesting area that that um is almost contentious in nature because of the variability you see out in the field with soil conditions and the ability to measure them and map to the vehicle performance at a level where you make million or not billion dollar purchases of a vehicle systems so it'll, it'll be a very interesting presentation I look forward to it. I believe this will be in August. Um, uh, the date should be out on the ISTBS website. Please go out there and look and, and pass it around. This, this should be a, a very interesting one for folks to key into. Uh, they all have been very interesting, but um, this, will, this will focus in more on field testing. And of course, the, the conference in, in Japan, we, we all look forward to people coming out there. You will get early bird right now in June. And, and, and next month, uh, sign up and, and come out. To, it'll be the Asian Pacific Conference. And then the following year, we will have it in the United States, uh, where we should have a location in the next couple of months. But it'll be either up north in, in Vermont or down south, or there's a, um, a couple of places in the Midwest that have, have uh, shown some interest. Um, Varsha, that's 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 all I can uh, think yep. of. Did I miss anything? Nope, you're you're right on point, and I guess that's all we have. <laughs> all right, thank you, thank you everybody for uh, chiming in. We we look forward to the next DES series, and uh, thank you, Varsha, for all your hard work putting this together. And <laughs>
Boomer. Yep. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.